trauma is the unexpected, the unpredictable. It happens when you don't expect it, and it cuts across race, social status, gender, professional stature. It affects everybody. It is blind to who you are. Trauma is a family of five getting into the car, singing and cheering, going to a ski trip, and two hours later, half of them are dead, and the other half are fighting for their lives in some intensive care unit. And, and this is the beauty of trauma. As, as awful as it is, as unexpected as it is, as unpredictable and taxing as it is, we have the great benefit of seeing our patients coming back almost completely, if not completely, in the state that they were before they were injured. So that's a great thing about trauma. My team and I have a passion about early trauma care. Trauma as we defined it, broadly. Injuries and acute surgical emergencies. You see here, this is a well-known study that was done years ago and remains true today. You see that there are three times in which patients die after trauma. There is a small number of patients that we call late deaths who die weeks after the injury from complications of trauma. There is an equally small number of deaths that happens within, you know, a few hours of arrival in the hospital. But the majority, the overwhelming majority of people die before they even see a doctor. If you're injured, your likelihood of death is immensely high before you even arrive to a hospital. All these people die in the first hour after injury. And with all the things that we've done, we have managed to reduce the risk of death early after injury and late after injury, but the immediate after injury deaths, we really haven't made too much of a ding to the curve. So we thought that we would focus on this issue and we created the Center for Early Trauma Research in my team, <coughs> which had a mission and quite frankly, I think it's the only center that focuses almost exclusively in the early phase after trauma, almost exclusively, it focuses on the early, very early phase. And we started with, you know, research on, on various points, which then branched off and gave multiple projects here and there. And then we uh, decorated with other telemedicine projects and so on and so forth. But today, we will focus on what we call the signature project. We wanted to give you one focused idea so that you understand what we're fighting for and how do we hope that we will make a change, a true change in mortality or in survival after trauma. So we created a lot of, a lot of different ideas, but for today, for the next five minutes, I will try to summarize 15 years of research on one aspect. This aspect is by increasing pressure inside the belly, inside the stomach, you stop bleeding. About 20 years ago, we started doing laparoscopic surgery. Instead of doing surgery with a big incision, you do surgery with small incisions through a camera. So vastly different surgery. Instead of a big incision, small incisions and a camera to look inside. But in order to do that, you have to blow up the abdomen in order to create working space. Otherwise, you put the camera inside, inside the intestine and you can't see anything. You have to make it big so that your camera is there and everything else floats and you can see and work. And you do that by insufflating gas. Then it occurred to me that while the belly was insufflated, there was pressure against the bleeding vessel. So it couldn't bleed much, it was bleeding slowly. And I thought that would be a great thing if we had the appropriate tools. It's not 
huge science. It doesn't take surgical skills. Maybe a paramedic could do that. You find a patient bleeding, you stick a little needle, you have a device to insufflate, you insufflate the belly, you stop the bleeding, you can buy two hours to take this patient to safety, to a hospital. Otherwise, this patient would die. And then we did experiment after experiment after experiment in small animals and then in large animals. And we saw that whenever we created a standardized injury that would otherwise be lethal to the pig, this is an inferior vena cava experiment, this is a liver experiment, we had much less blood loss and much better survival in those pigs that were insufflated versus those pigs who were managed per standard of care. This is actually the experiment that I love the most because the spleen is a frequent cause of death. It's a relatively friable organ that can fracture, that can break, even when you fall on the pavement. It doesn't need humongous force, it can break relatively easily. So we created a very, very difficult model of reproducible splenic injury. It's very difficult to create it in an animal for various reasons. And, <clears throat> and you see here that those pigs that were managed as we manage patients today, they bled about 1,200 mLs of blood. This is, this is the entire blood volume of a 40 kilogram pig. They die. And, and those who were insufflated, we cut the blood loss in half. They survived. All died versus all survived. And, and therefore, experiment after experiment, we showed that this is a valid concept. And then we had to develop the tools. So we partnered with engineers from MIT, from Draper Labs, and we had to put the tools into the medic's hands, into the paramedic's hands. That was no good if surgeons can do the procedure. Once you arrive to a surgeon, there are other things that one will do. But, but how about there, in the paramedic's hands? So we had to create a smart needle so that the paramedic will put a needle without ever risking that he will injure you instead of help you. And we had to create a portable insufflator. You know, the, the insufflators that we use in the operating room now are like a, a giant machine. And we had to create that in a portable way that can fit in an ambulance. Maybe someday it will fit in a, in a medic's pocket. And then this is our second prototype, which now we've reduced it to a little bigger than, than our hand. And, and my charge to the, to the engineers is that I want a portable insufflator that is like that. That you can have it there in the ambulance shelf or in your pocket. And if somebody's bleeding there on the street, there goes the paramedic, has a special tool that I haven't talked to you about yet, that's another area of research, to diagnose that the patient is bleeding, pulls out the abdominal insufflator, puts in the smart needle, stabilizes the patient. We can buy now an hour, two hours, three if needed, with a stable patient to go and be saved in a hospital. And the reason why I'm sending this project is not only for its potential to save lives, but because it's now in prime time. It has completed all the work, the pre-human work or the animal work, and we are ready to bridge to a really big study. And in order to bridge, we need a small human study, and that's what we need right now, to create a small human study to convince everybody that this is doable in humans in order then to get funded for a really big human study. I would estimate it that it's about half a million for, for, for a small human trial.